All right. Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome everybody to the first Zoom meeting. Uh, I have, hopefully we'll have more. Um, we'll see how this one goes. I'm gonna post, um, post them on my YouTube and see if they get good uh, feedback. And if so, we'll just have these periodically, kind of in substitution for the classes. Um, this year I've done a, a lot of classes across the country and just kind of taken its toll um, on me privately. So it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that it, this should be enough for people to go ahead and you know, buy a soldering iron and start practicing at home and, and just do it, you know, just get started on their own uh, without having to do a class. So how many right now in the group are actually doing board repairs, either in the field or in the shop? I've done one. Okay. I did one last week or earlier in the week on my uh, carrier drive. I do about one every other week or so. Okay. I did Harry's lab. <laughs> Harry had a, my partner had an emergency yesterday. I did his yesterday okay uh what was that uh, what was that on Ty? what was that on uh that was on the whirlpool you know the one with the little 10 uh 10 uf 50 volt right uh, interesting thing uh he gave it to me yesterday and two of the other small capacitors the, the same one somehow got sheared off in the bag i've never seen that before i don't know what happened um, Wait, what part got sheared? You know, that board has uh, three of those small capacitors on it. Yeah. The two that are together, see if I got uh, that board here. The two that are, that are together just were sheared off, and I don't know how that happened. They were laying in the bag as huh. if they were, I don't, I don't know how that happened. But anyway, I had to put three, I put three of them back on. Like broken off. Completely broken as if they were there was no remnants except for on the board nothing on the capacitor at all it was really amazing huh interesting well yeah because we had that one post that there was a, a mice eating through the capacitors <laughs> <laughs> i'd never seen that before that was good but you know i also don't know if harry if he likes to you know kind of nibble on the capacitors <laughs> harry eats a lot i don't know if he eats that much <laughs> so uh well, you know, actually, this is a really good form maybe for because uh, I don't know what's going to happen here. Um, I do have stuff prepared, but if if people want to kind of share stories and stuff like that, I'm all for it. Um, this is not the Mike Carlson show. This is really about just everybody learning from each other. That's what the re-engineers has always been about. And uh, so I'm I, we have to test this Zoom uh uh, structure because I've never do, done a large group like this. I've always done just one on one. So I'm not sure. It looks like it's automatically muting people. Um, yeah. And so that's nice so that we don't hear a lot of background noise. Um, but uh, what, what are your, some, uh, some of your thoughts uh, for those that have been doing board repair? Um, you know, do you guys have other stories, you know, interesting stuff that's, that's been going on? I know sometimes. Not everybody will share what they have on Facebook. I know I'm obviously very, uh, very, you know, I do that a lot. I have a good, uh, you know, I have a computer and I can really, it's not a really big issue for me to go in there and, and type up, you know, stuff. And But for other people, it's not as easy. I understand that. Uh, so anybody want to share a story about a board repair? Okay, by the way, I wanted to, to say that, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, the UF uh, is actually a microfarad, uh, so it's a mu, M-U, uh, not U, and the reason they use the U instead of the mu is because it's, it's a different language, and so U is a lot easier to put on there, uh, so, uh, but if you look at a, a real capacitor, you know, on a board, you know, you'll, you'll see on the capacitor itself, you know, it's going to be, have a, a typically a, a, the mu signal, or uh, the mu letter, sorry. So, uh, 
All right. Well, let's, uh, oh, any, anybody want to say anything about any board repair, any kind of funny story, odd story, interesting story uh, that you've had in the last week or two? I don't know if it's really so much of a story, but a question. Sure. Far away. Uh, you know, uh, a couple of days ago, I had, was working on the Whirlpool board and ended up <laughs> had a back out and the kit that I ordered. I know on the Whirlpool vertical modular washers, the capacitor for the motor can be like 45 microfarad, but it's like plus or minus 5%. Is that the same for capacitors on boards or do they have to be at or above the rating? Uh, that's a good question. So we're talking about electrolytics versus, you know, your standard motor capacitor. Uh, obviously they're made, uh, made quite different and yeah. they're, they're going to be, you're going to have like 20% tolerance is the standard, okay. is the norm. And then uh, you can have a, a closer tolerance, which would be like 10%. That's a, okay. a kind of elevated, better tolerance. I don't pay much attention to that because the capacitance, it kind of puts you in the ballpark and that's fine right. for what we need. So I don't, I don't really uh, pay as much attention to that as I do the life. Uh, the uh, hours, right? So if it's uh, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 even, I'll go with the highest life uh, that the manufacturer uh, rates it at. And they do testing on those. Uh, so the long life obviously is going to be best for our customers. Um, right. And then obviously the microfarad rating, you want to be exactly at the microfarad rating. Um, you don't want to go plus or minus. I'm not going to go into too much detail into that because there's arguments for and against, and it's just, and sometimes very sometimes it's going to matter. So why not let's just do it, you know, um, it just makes sense. Um, but a whole other story, we all know that you can be at or higher uh, on the voltage, the difference, or sorry, that what comes into play is the size of the leads. Sometimes you put that larger cap in there and the light size of the leads are too big uh, for the pads, the holes in the pads, and now you have to drill them out. So that can be a pain. And that's one reason I kind of backed off and I'm concentrating more on the life hours rather and, and just kind of being at or slightly above the voltage. Um, it, let's say if it's a 10 volt uh, uh, electrolytic capacitor, going up to 16 is fine or 10, but I'm not going to go up to 50. I mean, you, you're sitting there trying to jam this huge capacitor in a very small space. Right. It's not gonna fit. So, yeah, did that, what was your original question? <laughs> <laughs> you, you pretty much answered, you answered it. it. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, to be um, honest with you, I've never once had a defective electrolytic capacitor come to me, and I've changed, obviously, many, many over my career. So that's a fluke. And also, I'd say, you know, I'd question also where, you know, where are we buying the capacitors from? If you buy it from, you know, eBay versus Mauser, I'm thinking that you're probably going to get less bad caps from Mauser than you are from eBay. Oh, uh, yeah, this was this was definitely an eBay an eBay cap. I was just cruising the Internet and saw it, and I was like, hey, I need a couple of those. So I just, <laughs> we got it just to give it a shot. But the next the next round is definitely coming from Mauser. Good deal. Uh, one thing also is that when you do, what I do is I, I have <coughs> Mauser – tab on my computer and then I'll just kind of add relays and, and capacitors and a bunch of other stuff uh, for my lab uh, and once I get a little threshold I, you know yeah it's going to be $7.99 for shipping it's like two days shipping $7.99 it's, it's a good deal um, and then I'll just order all at once and that way it's kind of like a shopping cart uh, at your parts dealer um, yeah. where you just add it to the cart and you forget about it let's say it's truck stock you just add it to the cart, add it to the cart, and then you get a list, and then boom, you order it, and it's waiting for you at the cart house. That's how I do it. That way. Cool. Yep. Good deal. All right. Any, anybody else? With the uh, I did mention um, in your video about the capacitors, uh, I put a um, comment there um, that I was trying to get the voltage reading off of capacitor, but I couldn't get it because it was so tied up against another <laughs> component. And I was using that MSR 100, and I needed the voltage to be able to uh, see if it was a good capacitor. Or not. You're talking about somebody cussing. I think the customer might have heard me. <laughs> uh, 
so that that was the advent that I came oh. back with the 881 and that worked pretty well um now what okay so why wouldn't you just take the cap out to and do a visual one because i'm not as fast and as good as you are just taking caps out real easy <laughs> yeah but you have the fancy fancy china desoldering gun right yeah but you know I, I i was trying to do just a quick a quick check and didn't want to go i didn't think it was bad so i didn't want to go through all that uh okay, but you, you did the mesr and did it test good um it tests good you know what that default language is it tests good and it, the voltage is 25 or something like that but i couldn't tell what the voltage was you know um you know how that does yeah i, I hear you that's one thing i like about this i don't have to worry about yeah. the voltage on this yeah. unit. uh now guys uh how many on here have uh an esr meter specifically yep. this one or, or, I do. or another one. Okay. And so just got mine. I have both of them. Yeah. But now, this one. Go ahead. This one, um, and, I, and I left it in your comment the other day as well. I'm not still learning it. Um, I put it on a capacitor and nothing showed up. I'm like, is this thing already broke? I just got it. Yeah. But I it know. was it was uh, over voltage, I believe. And so that sort of threw me off, but now I understand. Well, it would be it would be the resistance once it hits uh, yeah. over thirty, then it's just right. not going to register as an electrolytic capacitor. Right. That is one of the things that I don't like about this guy, as well as this guy. It's like really the only. Oh, there we go. So. What's the difference between those two right there that you you have? All right. The only difference is the you see on this one right here, uh, you have this slider. Just a sec. I'm trying to get it. There we go. You see that slider there? Yeah uh there we go and so you can actually um adjust the threshold the resistance threshold for the alarm so okay. if you want to chime at you know 30 ohms uh then it'll chime at 30 ohms or less or at 150 ohms usually i set it around 150 ohms um because really the circuits we work on they they aren't lower than that typically there's one case i did find it was and that was kind of a pain because I took a few capacitors out and found there was no problem with them. Um, I thought there was a short circuit, but basically the closer you are to here, so this is this is zero ohms at the bottom. Okay, there we go. And then at the top, it's like, what, 500? Yeah, 500 ohms. Okay. So if you put this on a circuit, on a resistor that's 500 ohms, if you set this right here, then it'll be right at the threshold for the alarm okay and the alarm sounds like this okay that's that's, that's the alarm for a short circuit and which model is that mike oh my gosh <laughs> we're gonna go <laughs> i have a video on this uh i i don't recommend this one because the guy who's putting them together is a dingbat so <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, to be honest the the real the original designer is eds uh it's a one-man show the, the guy is brilliant uh as far as electronics goes uh and so he's a great design and i love the unit the problem is is that the guy he sold it to that's doing that's putting them together uh is not doing a good job he's sh shipping them out and they're uh they're coming just defective they're they're coming defective uh and also uh slow shipping time so like you know it takes weeks to get them to actually put one of these together that's also one man show it's up in merced and uh and so if he's improved his business great but it just from from my dealing with him uh through other people it's just not been a good uh a good time so uh so that's why i recommend the bk even though it's, it, it doesn't have the slider, which is that's good. I'm not even sure what the threshold of the uh, alarm is, but it has a short circuit alarm on this guy, and it sounds like this guy right here. There you go. Did you try that that um, LSR meter that the guy had recommended on that video that also does ESR? You know what I'm talking about? It was like a DET something or another. Oh yeah, you're the the DR five thousand. Yeah, did you try that? Yeah, it's in my van. I keep it in my van. I don't use it all that much. Um, it's very, it's very technical. Yeah, I was watching a video on that, and I'm like, I had to. It was way over my head. I'm like, whoa. 
who's that who's that that bailed j appliance just has like an empty seat <laughs> that's great uh so um anyways <laughs> who is that jay uh, yeah jay <laughs> hey, mike yes uh, i have a question but before you before you get there let me answer the question um it's not very user friendly in the field in the field we want something that tells us when you have a capacitor is it good or is it bad that's all i want to know okay. i don't want to go into the details of the queue and uh, you know uh, the dissipation factor and all this stuff and nobody well not nobody i care but everybody else really doesn't really care on our group about that and so there's no need for that and this right here uh it has a colorful display so uh so <laughs> it's very user friendly it's a green means go white is kind of in the middle and then the blue is not so good or actually it's sorry on this one it's red and white and blue so red's bad for everybody and that's the same thing here this is green yellow and red i like this color scheme better um but uh but it is what it is uh, i guess i could take the plastic off of it huh <laughs> yeah, Walt, Walter's going to get on you for that. <laughs> Dogged me for years about that. I just literally wouldn't take plastic off one of my meters because it dogged him so much. Uh, uh, he dogged me about it so much. Go ahead, uh, Frankie. So that's, that's to, uh, to test um, capacitors and uh, resistors, right? It's just for electrolytic capacitors. Oh, okay. Uh, you guys want me to, to get a capacitor to test here? So I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you what it does. Just a sec. I didn't really plan on this, but okay. I'm going to do a medium size capacitor. I have no clue what it is. It says 10 microfarad at 50 volts. Let's see, ah, I, you're probably not going to. It's small, so you're not going to see it. So, uh, so this guy right here, we turn it on. Unfortunately, there is no auto off on these. Um, I think it does beep if you leave it on. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. All right, so what we're gonna, with 10 microfarads, Zach, let me back this light up. I, uh, let's see, there we go. So 10 microfarads is right here, okay? We wanna line it up so that whatever our reading is, it's, it's either in the white or in the blue, right here. So we want to be in, we don't want to be higher than the red right here. Is that, I just want to make sure I'm on the camera, right? Okay. So uh, let, let's see what the, what it is. Just a sec. This is not, this is not going to be easy because I got working with too few hands here. All right, there we go. That's our reading. And there. Okay. Now I'm just going to tell you what it is because I don't know if you guys can see it. It's 0.8. So that's 0.8 ohms of resistance. Now, how this difference differs uh, from your standard meter is the meter, uh, uh, regular DMM is gonna test DC resistance. This is not DC resistance. This is AC resistance. So it's responding to a frequency, okay? And I'm not gonna go into the details of all that, but just know that a capacitance testing uh, with your multimeter is not the same thing as this. And this is the real test for an electrolytic capacitor. And so you can see it's, uh, if I line it up, it, 10 microfarads is well in the blue here. Okay. Welcome back. Hey, Jay. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you have a bad cap and it's registering in the red area, then that's not good. Now, it's not a pass or fail. Everybody wants a pass or fail. You have a like a lid switch on a top load washer. It's defective. It's busted open, right. fried, whatever you want to call it. It's yeah. definitely defective. And then you have one that's in in the in the in the bag, and it's definitely good. Okay. And uh, and so that's not how capacitors test, though. So if if you're in the blue over here, then that's very good. That's an A. Okay, if you're on the border between the white and the blue, let's call it a B. If you're in the white, let's call it a C. I would say it would be a D, but once you get like a capacitor that's supposed to be up here and it's like way over here, right? Then that would be an F. Okay. And the reason why we grade them like, or 
the reason I came up with this grading system is because <laughs> I've been finding a lot of defective caps, but they don't affect the operation of the unit. And this is a very important point because you can find a bad cap that's, let's say, marginal. And you can say, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Customer, uh, I'm going to change this cap and it's going to solve all your problems in your life. <laughs> well, it's not. And it's not going to solve actually any problems. Is it a good idea to change it? Yes, because it will lead to a problem down the road, right? <laughs> but it's not necessarily the problem that you're having right now. So. Wow. So that's just a, a really important note uh, on these on changing capacitors and testing capacitors. Not, we don't need to test, like you know, the ten microfarad at fifty volt. I mean, do we really? Yeah, I I probably test it every time, but you know, it's it's a known issue. Is my point. Uh, the F one error. Do we have to really open it up to know what on the duet dryer. Do we have to open it up to know what's not? We know what we're gonna find. We're gonna get the char mark on the plastic. We know the relays gotta be changed. It's, it's nothing new. And so we have these types of repairs that we do all the time for board repair. They're chronic repairs. And then there's the other side. Uh, sometimes, you know, I say, hey, I got this board and, you know, what's the problem with it? Uh, it's, it's failed, what's the problem with it? There's no way that I can know that. There's no way because I've never seen it and nobody's seen it, but it's a chance for you to diagnose it, right? It's just like in, in, uh, in appliance repair when, when we're on the uh, other floor, we're talking about other repairs. Boy, I've never seen that. Oh, nobody's ever seen it. Okay, well, there's those types of repairs for boards as well. There's the chronic ones, and then there's the ones we just have to go down, diagnose it, and 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 do it. And that's why we have to have these tools. Is you know, if you're just changing the 10 microfarad capacitor and the F1 uh, relays, do you need these? No, these are diagnosing tools. This is I want to find the problem type of tool. Versus, okay, I, I need a soldering iron to replace those parts, um, and I need you know solder, I need wick, and all the whatever you want to however you want to approach those. So you understand, understand there's, there's board repair where we're just repairing boards. And then there's the other part where we're getting there and diagnosing the boards. Sometimes I, I feel like not everybody is on the same page on that. <laughs> kind of the, like, like they message me and say, Hey, what's wrong with this? There's no way I can know. <laughs> what I need to do is I need to guide you through steps for troubleshooting. Well, sometimes people don't want to do that. They don't want to, they just want to know, you just tell me what the part is. We're not, we don't, you know, that's not what we are. We're supposed to be techs, the thorough techs, professional techs that diagnose properly. No and part danger, right? It's a learning process, you know, so I get that too, that this is kind of new, uh, new for a lot of techs. So, sorry, uh, what were you going to say? Uh, okay. Oh, I was like, no part changers. Yes, yeah, and I, I don't like to, yeah, okay, yes, I do sometimes, but um, I, I like to call a spade a spade, and, and if somebody's just going to, you know, just say, hey, I'm going to replace a board, I don't care about that, okay, well, that's more PCM than, hey, I'm going to go and diagnose the board and change the part on the board that failed. Mike, I, I have a quick su suggestion, um, okay. and Frankie reminded me, because Frankie's doing it properly. That if we're not talking, you know, cut our mics off. Otherwise, we're going to be hearing all kinds of background noises, and it, sometimes it gets distracting. Yeah, um, good call. Yeah, yep. so, Frankie, I saw you doing that. I'm like, that's what that's what we need to do. So I just hit your hit your screen and then hit the audio off. Well, yeah, we got uh, quite a few more uh, that signed on, so that's good. Uh, so what I was going to do is. And this, this may be cut up into a couple uh, different meetings. Um, is I'm going to actually uh, solder, uh, desolder and solder a relay. And I'm going to use that uh, microscope uh, camera uh, to do it. And so if you guys have questions or anything, then uh, go ahead and, and ask. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and switch to my camera. There we go. Okay. Just that. Getting all fancy with it. <laughs> all right. So this, yeah, this this guy right here. So we're gonna.
change out this this really let's say we think it's bad or we know it's bad we tested it and it's bad okay so we're gonna i'm gonna just go ahead and um do a close-up of kind of what what it looks like uh well no not that really sorry 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 it's gonna be one of these smaller relays i don't want to do one of those those uh those rivet type connectors. I just want to do a, a regular soldering uh, pad here. Okay, so I'm going to switch. Uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. Now, what we're going to see is this guy right here, If the zoom's off, let me know. I, I, I can't really see it very well. Just a sec. Uh, pin video. Okay, there we go. I can see it. That's perfect if you're showing us the R19. Sounds like a little sarcasm there. <laughs> Just play it. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, we're going to go with this one right here. Okay, so those, no. There. Those two right there. Okay, that's perfect, R19. There we go, just for TK. So those two right there are the coil for this relay. And I'm testing, I'm getting 1,250 ohms. So 1 1.2 kilo ohms, right? So this is where the 12 volts or whatever voltage uh, it's supposed to be that's that engages the coil and then closes the contacts here right so here we're gonna this is a um, these are the two uh, soldering pads that I'm gonna desolder and what I'm gonna use is the aqua desoldering iron okay so there we go there's two. Now you can see a little better lighting here. There we go. You see it sucked really all the solder out. You guys see that? There's really no solder left in there. Okay. Now that's one reason I use the Hakko desoldering iron or the Hakko desoldering gun is because it sucks all the solder up. I don't have to worry about wick and leaving a little solder. Now, do you guys know what to do if there's a little solder left over? Just a little bit? I'll show you. I'm taking the screwdriver and I'm pushing on the pin this way. If there's, if there's a little solder bridge, then it will disconnect. You see that? Okay. So that's what you do if there's if it's just just a little bit of solder left, and it's not coming out right. So there you go. So um, now we're gonna have to desolder the coil. That was that was a contact. So right here, that's the coil. There we go. See that? I mean, you can see that's all loose in there. So. And there you go. There's our relay. So the more important thing is, I'm going to actually just go ahead and solder it back in. And you know it's you know it's the coil. This might be a, a dumb question, but you oh, know no, it's the coil. Here. You know it's the coil because it has resistance, right? That's correct. So, okay. so if I test it out, okay, just a sec. Let me get back on there. Okay, there we go. That looks so sweet. <laughs> okay, so over here it's. 1.2 between these two here is 1.2 uh, kilo ohms of resistance. If I test over here, what am I going to have, guys? Nothing. Nothing. Oh open. yeah, OL or open, right? Now, if if I take a power supply and I put 12 volts over here, what am I going to test over here? Closed. That's right. Circuit. Closed or zero ohms, whatever you prefer. And that's how this 
relay operates. Now, this is a single pull, single throw. So basically imagine there's another contact over here. If there were, let's say, that would be normally closed, right? And then when you apply the voltage, that it switches from here, right? So there's a contact that's being made over here versus now the normally closed. It's, it's just like a micro switch, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Normally closed, normally open. The difference here is, is that we are actuating it with a voltage, right? Instead of a mechanical switch of what, like a actuation, like a, the door closing or opening, some sort of a mechanical uh, actuation, right? right. So right. For now, and actually, this may be more important. Uh, and solder it back in. This was kind of the reason I got it. I'm sorry, Mike, but I, I can't hear you because uh, the other phones aren't muted. All right, every, uh, everybody who's not talking, go ahead and mute, please. All right, and so I'm going to bend these a bit. You see what I'm doing? Why am, why am I doing that? Sorry, my uh, southern accent's kind of coming in. So you guys are affecting me. Uh, I, I, I used to live in, in North Carolina, so I, I, I hear a southern accent and I kind of start talking that way again. <laughs> so, uh, Sorry so, about that. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> the reason I bend these, right, is so it'll stay in place when I'm soldering. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tin my tip. You guys all saw that banner? With, with the uh, tinning of the tip and with the tinner instead of the solder. Okay. So you see, I got nice and, and shiny that tip is. Okay. So you, you put the solder tip on this side and then you actually, then you heat it up, you wait a bit, and then you apply the solder to the other side. You wait a little and then pull up. Okay. That's how you solder. A connection okay so let's go ahead and try the other side here now when I pull up I, I pull up toward, uh, on the actual lead I you know wherever the leads pointing that's that's how I, I'm pulling off of it and that way the the solder will kind of create this uh, you know Mount Doom effect is what I call it for lack of a better term. And let's see, here we go. So a couple more, gonna clean off my tip. So heat it up a bit. This say that did not take, concentrating on the video. <laughs> All right, heat it up, there we go. And this one. Now these soldering pads are a little different in that they have uh, this kind of a, a star rivet type of a, a pad. And that's not, it's not, it's not, I don't, I don't see that as much. I don't know even, oh, this is one of the boards from uh, uh, Bezor, the Bezor boards. He sent me a box. Uh, from uh, Reliable, they had a, a bunch of boards and they just shipped them to me. So that was a nice gesture. Uh, Mike, can I cut in with a question real quick? Go ahead. And it might be a stupid one. Nope. When you're when you're testing the coil end of those relays, yep. do you do you use a nine volt battery out in the field, or what do you use to test them to make sure the AC end closes? Uh, I don't. Um, I test it with the load. So okay. I use the board and I, let's say, um, okay, we're working on a BMW and the drain, it's not draining, right? Yeah. Okay. And there's a relay on those boards that'll close for the drain. Well, what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put it in test mode. And what's the, what's the test number for drain? I yeah. cannot remember. 
it's a, it's uh, seven. So it's that uh, one, two, three, dash, dash, dash. Um, just a sec, let me switch since we're we're done with this. Uh, there we go. So it's so it's uh, three three blinking lights. So you got one. You know, it's a binary code, right? And the binary number is seven. I I recommend memorizing that just because it's easy to. Uh, it, it's all over the place in appliance repair binary codes. So it's like eight eight four eight four two one is the the digits for the light sequence. Right. I think. Okay. Right. So if you have uh, four, two, and one, those three on, that's the number seven. And that, yeah, you can go to the tech sheet and look it up, and it'll say, you know, if these light up, then it's a seven. But you can also go on, you know, online, and there's a chart for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven through 16, and then you'll see which ones are, uh, you know, it's because it's zero and one, right? That's, that's binary counting. Anyways, doesn't matter. Don't want to get on that. Um, so on, on soldering, how many feel like, okay, yeah, that's, that's kind of not a problem. I can solder that, that good. Uh, a couple uh, of I'm good on soldering. What was that raise hand, Kyle? Okay. So, Sorry. I was, I was muted. I was just, I was raising my hand and saying, okay. Yes, so, okay. All right. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, Ty, you're you're good with that. No, well, quick question. Um, I guess it's more of an estimation, but sure. Um, about how long would you say you'd leave your your sorting iron on before you cause damage to the capacitor or to that relay or any any component? Would you say? That's why I like high heat. You know. Yeah, I, you use what eight fifty. What do you what do you use when you eight fifty? I I don't go lower. Lower is a waste of my time. Anybody, look, if you want your time wasted, that's fine. That's, <laughs> I mean, I, I do 850 because I heard you say it, so that's all I do. Right. But um, well, you saw how quick I'm on there, right? Yeah. I, it's just kind of on and on. I mean, it's not that quick. Because what you have to do is you apply the soldering iron to the pad in the pin, and then and they heat up, and then you bring the solder from the other side. And if the solder melts when you're touching the pad and pin, not the soldering iron, you know that the pad and pin are hot enough to receive the solder. It's kind of an important detail, I guess, of what we're doing here. So you don't, I noticed you didn't use any flux. I know you use a rosin core, but you don't use any flux even um, uh, at all? No, no, I do. I have it. I got it right here. It I mean, but I, I noticed you didn't do it right then. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you want to take a break and, you know, if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> but for the most part, you don't really need it. I mean, there's like surface mount components. You can, you know, kind of dab the bottom of it and place it and it'll kind of stick in place. And, and on, on, you know, let's say if you have eight pins, SOIC, uh, you know, and, and so you, those are tough. And so, yeah, I use it for that, for surface mount, but for a basic two or four through hole component, I just don't think it's necessary. Uh, and the paste, do you use the paste? Do you have the paste? I, I have, um, you know, one of the syringes. Okay, the syringe, I, I, now is there fluid in the, or paste in the syringe? Uh, it's paste. Okay. Yeah, put it in jail, you know. Well, jail. I've just never been able to find it useful at all. Okay. Um, now, what it does is, is it, you know, cleans the pad. But I think when, here's the other thing, is that when you're desoldering with a desoldering gun of choice, uh, then you're, you're, you're melting that solder, right? And you're sucking it all through with one quick motion. Mm -hmm. And that's actually helping to clean the pad, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I were using, let's say, braid, and you know I'm 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 on the pad a lot, and you know applying solder, and I don't know. I could see it with that, maybe needing the flux. But with desoldering it, it's a really quick motion, and it's and I find the pads to be very clean when I desolder. So that just may be a, a positive side effect from using the desoldering gun over, uh, you know, a pump or or wick. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, look with the pump, 
it's the the end is made of plastic, right? Yeah. That's not good for your pad. I'm just right. theoretically, you know, you're you're heating it up. So how much of the that plastic uh, end of that pump is getting left on the pad? You know what I mean? Because mm. you know you have to eventually replace those pumps because the the end gets so nasty and and because of the heat they they're not useful anymore. I never thought about that. Yeah, because I have one that uh, has silicone tips that you buy replacement tips. So that does tell me where where's that silicone going? Going oh, exactly. Yeah, I never thought about that. Yeah. Uh, any other questions on what we've done so far? Yes. Uh, quick question. Uh, this goes back to the relay on the coil resistance of the relay. By the resistance, can you tell how many volts it will be, and also which will be positive and negative of the coil to know which way the coil will flow? So it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, you could put, you know, if you take it out of circuit and test it with a power supply, an external power supply, then it doesn't matter. Uh, there are a couple ways to test. If you test the, uh, the coil and go to the data sheet for that relay, um, well, if you go to the data sheet anyways, it's going to tell you the coil by the, by the, 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 the part number code, right? So it'll tell you if it's a, you know, uh, G8. P dash one a four dash twelve DC or something like that, then it's pretty evident that yeah, that's a twelve DC. Sometimes it's not so evident. Some of these relays have like, you know, uh twelve dash twelve dash eighteen. It's like, is it eighteen or is it twelve? We don't know. Uh so it's so we do have to look that up. And how you look those up is testing them. What's the coil resistance? And then matching up to a newer version of that uh, of that part, because uh, that's that's where I've found is like the old part number uh, doesn't have a data sheet associated with it anymore. It's like they got rid of them, and now they have a new version of the part. They didn't want two data sheets, so they said out with the old and with the new. And it and and but the coil resistance is going to be the same for the old part as the new part. So that's good news for everybody. And obviously, if you don't know and you post and you can't find it on, on the internet, you know, you Google the data sheet for it, you can't find a data sheet, we have an archive and we have done a lot of research for a lot of different relays for a lot of different appliances. And so if you ask, hey, what's the, you know, what am I looking at here uh, as far as a, a voltage for this relay, a lot of times we'll just be able to look in the archives and find it really quickly. Awesome, awesome. I had to be you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Sounds good. All right. And uh, so uh, one other thing I wanted to kind of go over with was I was kind of surprised at, at the, uh, the tracing of the relay of, of, of L1 coming through to the board, through the relay, out from the board to the load, to neutral and how on on one of the uh i think it was a quiz on yeah it was a quiz on that one how i didn't really get a lot of responses and uh how i kind of had to kind of walk people through that and so i figured uh, that would be a good uh thing to go over uh today now i know some of you have actually done the class and actually have gone through this before so it's going to be a bit of a repeat I'm using the jazz board and uh, I'm going to switch to a screen sharing uh, in just a second. So this is my jazz board tester. Okay, so you have the back of the board, right? You got the front of the board. And for a lot of technicians out there in the field, it's just a board. This is one whole unit, and we know that we don't, uh, we don't look at it that way as we're engineers. Uh, so we're interested in the two relays. I'll just go ahead and tell you what they are. Uh, this guy right here, that's the compressor relay. And then this one right here is the defrost relay. Okay. The compressor obviously is, you know, got a bigger, well, why is it that we have a larger, because we know that the larger the relay, the more current capacity it has, right? So why do you think the compressor relay is larger than the defrost relay? 
when, when the compressor runs at, what's the current of a compressor? One, between one and 1 1.2, something like that, maybe 0.9, somewhere in there, right? Doesn't matter what exactly it is. But how much is a defrost? What's a defrost run at? Four, four amps, somewhere in there, between three and five, right? So why is it that the compressor is larger? Right. Starting amp on the compressor. Right. What's the what's the inrush current for a compressor? What what are you gonna find it to be? I, that's a harder question, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but uh, usually you can it'll run up to six times its normal run. That's what I found. It can be more, and same for a motor, right? So we have to have beefier relays because of the inrush. Uh, current on the compressor. So, uh, did you guys uh, see the uh, the JPEG file that I uploaded uploaded uh, for this part of the class or it's not the class <laughs> meeting? Um, did you guys see that? Yeah, I saw it. Okay, sounds good. So uh, I'm gonna do a well. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna start the screen sharing now. Then, uh, let's see, just a sec, not that one. Desktop. There we go. Okay. And so I'm looking on the relay, right? And this is what I'm seeing. is It's a G2RL, and this is for the compressor. See, it's the larger one. So uh, on the on this relay, it does say it's a 24-volt relay, right? But we want to see which pins on the back of the board go to the relay. What's the coil? And what's the contacts? So we go to the data sheet, and we're gonna go to this one. Uh, spoiler alert, <laughs> when you look at the back, back of the board, this is, this is the one we're gonna see, okay? So um, this right here is your relay, right? This signifies that it's what? What part of the relay? So it's a coil, right? And then this part over here, it's gonna be your contacts, okay? On, on this one, we only have, it's a um, normally open uh, contact, okay? And so this one right here, if we had it in there, and there's plenty of relays like this in our occupation, then we have this one's the normally closed, this one's the normally open. So if you see a relay and you see a bunch of pins on one side, and then a couple pins on the other side. There's not a hard, hard and fast rule, but in general, the two pins that are alone are gonna be the coil, okay? So that's just, that's that one. So there's the uh, compressor relay, and I'm gonna switch back over. Just a sec, uh, stop share, and I'm gonna, okay, there we go. Oh, now, look at the back of the board here. Oop, just a sec, there we go. So you can see, I don't have this plugged in for anybody that's concerned for my life. So you see these two lone pins here and here. That's gonna be your coil, okay? The, the pins up top are gonna to be normally open contacts, okay? So when you have ply 12 volts here, these contacts are made. And now look at this, this pin right here is the blue wire, okay? And this pin right here, the second pin, is the red wire, okay? So let's go ahead and go to the data sheet. Share and... There, this one. Okay. Get that out of the way. Okay, so we got the red wire coming to the board. That's from L1, right? Okay, now six goes here, L1, to the compressor, and comes out to the compressor, and then you have neutral, right? So this relay is switching L1. That's not always the case. Sometimes they do switch neutral, and you can you know, track that like Samsung has a lot of neutral switching. Uh, on theirs. So uh, the next one is the defrost. It's going to use L1 as well. And we're assuming that it's going to 
that the relay is going to connect here, right, and go through there. But we can prove this. How? Here's the tan, right? We're, we're looking at, at the next pin over. So we got the red one, then we got the tan one, right? And then, so the red one is here, and you can see that large, oh, I'm sorry, there we go, that large plane. You see this large plane that connects the red? Makes sense because it wants to go, the L1 is going to want to go everywhere because it's a common connection. And then it's going to want to go through here. You see these two pins? So you got L1. And then you got the, D, the uh, normally open connection, right? And then down here, you got the coil. There and there. Now, uh, let's see, just one second. Yeah, OK. So uh, and then it comes out. And that's, that's pretty much how you trace a relay that is switching L1 or neutral, doesn't matter, um, through the board. So any, any questions on that part of it? Let's see. Everybody's muted. Okay, so was that did, was that helpful for? Absolutely. Okay. Good. 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 But yeah, fantastic. That was great. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Man. Well, yeah, Ty, that was uh, it was too bad. That was actually the uh, Scarlet class was the first one I think that, or maybe the second class I did the uh, the jazz board. Uh, yeah, I, I missed that one. That was too bad. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunate. But I know you, you're glad to come to North Carolina anyhow, so you can get back to your roots. <laughs> that trip <laughs> devastated me. Anybody that saw me at that class, I mean, <laughs> they were like, "You just go and get some sleep." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was. You good. did look tired. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. I didn't sleep at all that previous night. I mean, I was going on thirty some hours of being awake. And I and that's when I started the class. You know. Goodness gracious. Yeah, I was like, give me some coffee here. <laughs> so, but uh, but yeah, good stuff. Uh, was there were any other uh, you know kind of topics of interest? I'd like to say a couple of things. Uh, housekeeping. Go ahead, anybody? Yeah. Do you have in-person classes like where you or is everything you do online like this? Now, this is actually the first uh, online um, meeting. I'm calling it a meeting uh, because we're going to cover different topics um, in these. And really, the topics we're going to cover are not going to be as you know theoretical. Uh, it's going to be more how, what's going to help you to advance board repair for you and your business because it's it's uh, board repair is the new sealed system repair. We we were making a lot of money on sealed systems before, then LG came around. <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, you can make some money at this, and uh, you know it's just. Well, I'm just more of a hands-on. I'd rather be there with you with my hands on it than watching like that, which I'm learning right now. But I was wondering if you had any classes um, which you and like I, that I've way. Had uh, this year, I've done um, anybody that was there that from a class that I didn't mention, just mention it. Uh, Dallas, Nashville, Charlotte, Omaha. I don't know. I'm forgetting some. But I, I've done a lot of classes across the states this year. Um, and it's, you know, the holidays are coming up. I'm, I'm just not going to be traveling right now. Uh, You're going to do one at ASTR again? No. I decided not to. Uh, it's there's a there's politics involved there, but it is what it is. Uh, the, Say no more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I see they excoriated. Who was that? Pulse. <laughs> they said that letter out about Pulse. Uh, uh, no, could you expand on that, Ty? Um, those guys from Pulse. You know, oh, they had. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah I remember. remember that letter they sent out? They really sort of blasted them. Yeah, but they were trying to make money. I mean, you know. Yeah. With, with with what all the stuff that I do and everything, it's just it's all volunteer work. I know people pay for the classes, but it's it's the money. 
doing it. Uh, the money just gets poured back into, you know, finding, you know, repairs, all this instrumentation uh, that you see uh, really helps me in finding solutions for our problems. Has anybody had uh, use with the Whirlpool LED board uh, findings that we had? You guys come across that? Bad LED boards for the uh, side by side all, all the time, I one or two. all the time yeah so, so yeah i mean i i mean i've never actually gone out on one, one time now that being said bakersfield uh is kind of a has a history or, well kind of a foundation of being a cow town and uh if you have a, a light that's out in the fridge that's par for the course for bakersfield so that's one reason we don't get our calls on those. It's not that they're not there. It's just whatever, you know. Um, and then some people are very, in other cities, are very, uh, uh, they're sticklers, and they have to have everything perfect in their house. We don't have a lot of that here. And uh, half of the people just wouldn't even notice that it was out. <laughs> so but if the fridge is not cooling, that's a whole other story that has to get taken care of so but uh but yeah there's a whole about i don't know half year eight months ago uh i did a whole thing on the led boards what goes wrong with them how to test them so if you don't if you haven't seen that that's on my youtube video channel or the, the youtube channel so you'd want to watch it if that's of interest to you mike i was raising my hand because i work um the beverly hills area so you gotta have everything so perfect like the lights and all that, so it's like I see that all the time. Yeah. Well, a lot of times, man, that that uh, it's just one LED that takes out all the LEDs, and they don't they don't actually take them out. It's just like a Christmas tree light where you take one out and then they all are off, but they're all good except for that one. So don't misunderstand. But what I came up with was a just a a, a bypass where if you put a, a three volt zener diode in there and just solder it in, then all the other LEDs turn back on. It, uh, but you just don't have that one LED in there. Unfortunately, those LEDs, I tried to desolder them. It's a one shot deal, guys. There's no desoldering those. You try to desolder that and it turns to putty. It's, it's, it's a horrible thing they did. But then again, that's, uh, that's Whirlpool. I'm just, I'm you saying they, they have it on the board all in series? Yes, all of those LEDs. In the, uh, it starts in the fresh food with the power supply. It has four LEDs. I, I know I'm backwards on the camera, but uh, my fresh food is on the right. <laughs> so you have the, the one uh, up there, and then you also have the one down low, and then you have the freezer, and it goes through basically all of them back to the board so it starts here one two three four wire harness one two three four wire harness one two three four and then back so if you try to jumper uh then you can cause a short circuit and you can fry the board just by trying to test it um if you apply voltage to any of these boards separately you can you can do that for the uh for the the boards that are uh you know the, just the leds but you can't, you can't just apply 120 volts to the power board and expect the lights to turn on. They will not turn on. Hmm. So, so there's, I, I, it's on the video uh, on how to test those and what to do and everything. So, um, if you guys are interested, I'll, uh, I'll bump. I've actually never ran into that issue, so. Okay. Sounds interesting though. Uh, it was very interesting and I actually spent about $800 on a repair I never did. You will run into it now. <laughs> it's all the way it always works. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, I right now I have like probably four of those boards that are working. I got sent, ah, I, 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 sorry, but I forget. Somebody sent me these boards because he was very interested in figuring out the solution. I wish I could remember. It was like eight months ago. I'm not good with him, so I apologize. But um, 
half the boards he sent me were good. I said, well, here, I'll ship them back to you. He's like, no, keep them. I was like, all right. I put them on my truck stock. But he did not have the, the ability or the know-how to test them, right? No, nobody does. Whirlpool does, but they won't tell us. The turkeys. So. Uh, Mike Carlson does. Yeah, so, well, that's why I did the video, so that everybody can find out and then have their, now, not a lot of people will have a global power supply in their van and be able to test it out in the field. Um, but I, I, I give you guys the opportunity, if you want these kind of, you know, advanced tools, then here's, you know, if you want them, great. I'm not trying to sell anything. I mean, there was some, some, some guy on the engineers who was like, you know, I don't need that. No, you Hardly need anything for repairs, but I want it, <laughs> so I buy it. <laughs> so I think you know there's a couple of factors. One, it helps it helps me to diagnose better. Two, it helps me to diagnose quicker. So how can you go wrong with that? No. I was curious. I was going to ask. Um... I know I spoke with you about this, Mike, but uh, is anybody else in the chat here um, doing home warranty work? Like AHS or cross country or 210 or anything like that? Nobody? Okay, well, then I guess my my advice would not uh, make, in, make a difference to you guys. But I talked to my local home warranty rep, and he was all in for board repair. He said, have at it, fix whatever you want. And he's down with that. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And do you think that that would be, uh, I, I remember us talking about that before. And do you think that that would be something that other home warranty uh, reps would be in favor of? In my experience, the home warranty companies are all about saving money. So if they can save money in the long run and, you know, if you could do it for, maybe not your normal 225 or whatever and do it for more like 175 or keep it under 200. They like to keep the repairs under 200 whenever possible, which I'm still making money at that point. So I'm happy. Right. Well, you know, I think, you know, for me on a board repair, I try to make about 240 and I'm happy, but, um, but, and the key is for any business is, you know, making money where, it's going to be beneficial to the customer, actually beneficial, but also that the customer views it as beneficial to them. There's are two completely different things, right? Because you can sell something that's not beneficial and make the customer believe that it is beneficial, right? I don't do that ever in my, uh, you know, that's why I try to, to do uh, board repair or diagnose whenever I can is so that I can give a, a, a make money, but also show the customer, hey, look at this board, it's $250 and I'm charging, and that's plus labor and tax and shipping and two trips and I'm charging 240, we have this day. And so the, custom, the perception of the customer is, well, I'm getting it cheaper, I'm getting it quicker, I'm, I'm, I'm loving this, you know, this, this, this is what we want for our customers. And so with the home warranty, okay, they like to keep it under $200. Well, you know, I, I try, I, I don't have my customers dictate pricing to me. It's just, it doesn't happen. But then again, I know not everybody's in my situation. I've been in my, in business for myself uh, seven and a half years now. And I didn't start that way. I started with, I'll take whatever work I can get. You know, I was installing ceiling fans, you know. Um, but you build your business in a certain way to where you want those people, those customers that are paying, good paying customers, customers that don't complain, customers that don't look up the part while you're in the customer's home and say, hey, I can get the part for $9.35, uh, you know, from, from eBay special, you know, that type of a thing. Uh, that's, that's, you know, you want to build your business uh, for maximum income, income that you can actually serve your customers 
well because your customers are also going to rate you. And so if they have a perception of, hey, he's an honest guy, he, he, he repairs quickly, uh, he, you know, when he comes home, he respects my home, he respects my family, um, and he does a great job, uh, then that's going to obviously be reflected in the reviews. And then more people are going to call you out because those people, are who, they're not shopping around for the best price. They've already had the technician out that was a good price and they have had that experience and they want something better. So they will pay more for that better experience. All right. Well guys, uh, you know, unless there's any other questions, that's we're a bit over an hour. Um, like to get your, uh, you know, feedback on the, on the group, maybe start a, a post or something like that. And, you know, Obviously, this is the first one, so a constructive criticism on how it went and everything would be appreciated. One, one quick question. Sure. Um, back to soldering. I meant to bring it up at that point. Um, what happens when you, uh, when a pad comes off? How, how do you, what do you do under those circumstances? Uh, you travel back in time and you make sure not to leave the soldering iron too long on the pad. <laughs> All right. Uh, no. Okay. So if you, okay, let's say I'm, I'm exaggerating here over here, you have the, the trace that's coming to the pad, right? Mm -hmm. Then you have the big loop over here. That's, that's your pad right there. So you have a trace and then you have the pad and then you have the hole in the middle, right? So if that hole pad comes off like this and it's kind of hanging loose in the wind, right? What you can do is just, as you're putting the part through, put the, the pad over it and you, know, you have to be careful not to rip it, right? And then push the pad through and make sure it, it's, it's lying flat as you're pushing the part pin through and you solder it and you're perfectly fine. As long as that trace the trace that's coming to did not get damaged where it connects to the pad, you're perfectly fine. It does not have to be attached to the board. But when your pad is like, where is it? <laughs> oh, well, that's a whole different story. <laughs> well, now, you know, I guess, I guess solder will put a lot more solder in it and it worked fine. But I, what, what I, I would do in a case like problem. that would be, uh, you know, to, to scrape off the insulation off the trace and just to fold over, don't cut the, the lead, fold it over, and then solder the lead to the trays directly. Okay. Um, and on that point, why, why do they, on that uh, 10 microfarad um, uh, capacitor, why do they fold the, the pin? You know what I'm talking about? They, they fold the, the stem on the negative? I ran into that and I thought that that was kind of, that was my first time seeing it and it was odd. I've, been seeing, I've seen it on three boards in a row. I remember you posting about that before. And I'm wondering why, because if you look at the pads, you know, the pad is sort of like horizontal and the other one's vertical, like a little bit bigger. I wonder why they're doing that or why they did that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't have a answer. I, I, I'd like to see it again. Um, you know, a picture or something like that. Cause I, I remember something about it, but it's not a common practice on boards. I've never seen that on a, a TV board. I think I got one right here, here. Mark. You got I don't one. Know if you can. Yeah. Just uh, pull it over. It's probably not the best. Hang on. Let me, <laughs> let me and, see if I can. And when you look at the way it's, uh, if we can uh, see it. You see the way the pad is? One is horizontal. Yeah. And one is one is bigger. Yeah, and look, like it has a slot in it. Yeah, that's where they fold the pin and stick it in there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't understand. Well, uh, just one second, uh, Kyle. Hey. Spot the spotlight there. Okay, you have one as well. I got the capacitor. I think I'm trying to use this napkin as a white background. I don't know if my phone's going to adjust to it or not. Like fold it over? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just doubled over on itself, and it's just the negative leg. Right. It looks like a big blob of solder. Yeah. But it's, it's actually the leg folded back. It looks like a looks like a candy cane with a messed up bin, like the bin was too harsh. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, what I'd say is they're, they're, they're obviously wanting more uh, of a connection, a, a physical connection, a mechanical connection between the pad, the solder, and the negative lead. I mean, that's the reason that they, sense. they would have that. Now, why would they do it? Let's say if you had vibrations or something like that, except it's on a neutral ground plane, there is, you, you have no vibration there. If you had an AC, you know, L1 or neutral, you know, then you do have vibrations in there that cause bad soldering, you know, over time, you know, cold solders. Um, but uh, there's, there's no vibration there. Uh, now, obviously, it's a fridge and there's a little vibration of the, but none that I would say would cause uh, cold solder joints eventually. Um, you don't need a large pad for that. And the reason is, is because uh, that's, you have DC voltage on there, right? So you don't have current flowing through that component. There's an argument that would say, yes, you do. And I agree with that. But I'm talking about substantial current, right? You don't have current go flowing through the capacitor to ground because the capacitor is not your load. And that's what I'm talking about. So if you have an AC motor, the motor's your load, right? And so you have current flowing through the motor. But with a capacitor with DC voltage across it, you have voltage across it, but because it's DC, you don't have voltage flow or sorry current flowing through it okay make sense and so why would you need a larger um pin attachment to the pad when you don't have a lot of current flow if you had a lot of current flow i could understand doubling up the lead right to make make the uh the the, the area but i mean look at the the F1 Duet dryer relay pin. Look at how thin that thing is. They don't double that up. And it's, it's, it's doing a lot more current than a capacitor will. So I really don't have a, a, a good answer for that. Um, I'm not, I didn't double it up when I replaced it. So I you know, don't, don't, don't lose worry about it. sleep about it. All right. No, it's no, no problem at all. Uh, I've never seen, that's on uh, Whirlpool products only, right? You've never seen it ever anywhere else. It's the only thing I've seen it on. Right. So I, I don't know. Whirlpool. Now that that being said, Whirlpool uh, hasn't designed their own electronics. They they outsource it. So who knows what kind of what companies we're dealing with here? Actually, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, but yeah, they uh, they they get their boards at like ten percent. I was going to say maybe if it was put together by hand, maybe that's a way to make sure they don't they put the uh, don't switch the polarity. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's a great thought. You know, yeah, if it's not done by machine, but if it's done by hand, that way they cannot mess it up. Yeah, maybe they have that guy from uh, from uh, Cranky Anchors, <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the eye. <laughs> maybe he's doing the install <laughs> of these parts. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's, that's good times all right well any other uh any other questions or comments yes frankie um i just want to thank you guys for uh you know mike for um for doing this thank you and um all you guys uh, uh you know for listening to me too <laughs> um just because i have to uh take my wife out i, I gotta i, I kind of have to go but uh but I really enjoyed this and hopefully we do this again. And uh, I just, I just want to say that, uh, you know. Okay. Absolutely. Thanks for, uh, thanks for your comment. The, the one thing that I would say, uh, I, I didn't get a lot of responses as far as like what you guys wanted out of this. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing it for you guys. So there's no way I can go what to put in the video or what's a prescription without your guys's input that would really help the future uh is to you know make suggestions on what you want in the videos and that that will help me to prepare uh, to be ready okay thank you mike all right thanks guys we'll all see right you guys engineers
Hey, all right, later. All right, bye.